I don't know what to do with my hands. It's so cold. <laughs> it is cold. <laughs> it's so cold here. I thought this was hot Lanta. It's, I don't know. I just moved here and I'm just figuring it out. <laughs> We are here with uh, Steve Litcher. You got it. Gosh, I nailed one. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in, guys. Um, Steve Litcher is front of house for? Story of the Year. Story of the Year. What a yeah. fantastic band, by the way. Yeah, they're, they're pretty okay, guys. I'm actually really excited to be here and really excited to be talking with you. Yeah, same. Um, thank you for taking the time to do this. My pleasure. Um, how'd you get hooked up with them? Uh, through management. Uh, so I, uh, <laughs> not the answer everybody wanted to hear but I work with a number of other bands, and uh, one of the bands I work with is Atreyu, and they share the cool. same management company. Okay. And Story of the Year had not been touring regularly. They sort of took a break in the mid-20-teens uh, and only did festivals and weekend events and things like that. And they released a new album, Tear Me to Pieces, um, okay. last year, and they, needed, they were gonna go out on tour to support it and management asked if I would like to TM front of house them, and I was, I couldn't say no. I couldn't say yes fast enough. So I jumped on the tour. It was their first tour back, uh, first time in a tour bus in like 10 years. It was like watching people tour for the first time again. They were just in love with everything and just had a blast, and uh, it's been nonstop fun ever since. Awesome, what a cool yeah. story, man. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's cool. Awesome, yeah. all right, let's do a little bit of gear real fast. Yeah. You're on one of my favorite consoles, the 1500. Yes. Uh, by these beautiful people. It's my favorite. Um, I love this console for a lot of reasons, uh, specifically the, the compact size of it, yeah. high speed, low drag, where you get all the processing of the larger 3500 other yeah. models as well. Why did you go with this? Is it just because of the size of the tour? Uh, High yeah. speed low drag. I actually own this one. This is yours. Yeah, this is my personal D Live. Um, I've been on D Live since. I knew I, there's a reason I liked you. Yeah. I've been on D Live since 2017. Uh, I started out with a CDM32 and an iPad, and then I graduated to a Surface and had a 3500 and a 2500. I had a little production company back in Wisconsin where I'm from. And so I had a number of D Live surfaces and mix racks. And then uh, pre pandemic, I decided to shut down my production company. I started it with the goal of getting into touring, and we can talk about that later. Okay. Um, I figured that when a band came to town, they just would have whoever owned the equipment mix their show, and that doesn't always happen that yeah. way. So um, in 2019, I shut down my production company for the most part, and right after I did that, about a month later, I got called to tour. And so the first thing I bought was my uh, Titanium 1500 and a CDM32, and last year it was in over 30 countries with me. So. Um, I love it for the reasons that you said, the small form factor. I've done everything from uh, DJs to orchestras on this thing uh, using 126 inputs uh, for an orchestra. And people say, well, you've only got 12 faders. You know, that's gotta be really difficult. But with DCA spills and the, the six fader banks, it's really, yeah. I, I prefer it to having a big console. Yeah. I've been lucky to tour with an S7000 with a couple of bands, and I just don't know what to do with all of the faders. I, yeah. I'm, I usually work in 12 or 16 faders and call it good. Let me show you this. See this? Come here real fast. It's the same thing, but smaller. So what it's really essence talking about something bigger, you can go larger from this. Yep. You get the same exact as that. It's as cool as right there. Who would have thought? All right. Um, also, you said you got the, uh, which version of it? The steel uh, version? Uh, titanium. Ti titanium yeah. version, yeah. okay. For flying, yeah. right? 
Yeah, uh, in my case, uh, I use a Justin Case company case. Um, I actually designed it myself. Uh, has a really nice large pull-out handle for getting through airports easily. Yep. Uh, you're not just grabbing onto a little flip latch handle and you know kicking your heel into the back of the console yeah. all the time. But it flies right at 50 pounds. Uh, some airlines 51, some 49, just depends on the scale. Got it. But it flies no problems whatsoever. And like I mentioned, it's been in 30 countries last year and it's hasn't missed a beat, uh, knock on wood. <laughs> I love this thing because it's so reliable. I've been on other tours. Um, I was on a tour earlier last year uh, with a different console. I wasn't mixing, it was the uh, headliner and every channel on the headliner's board became hi-hat in the middle of the show. And they tried everything to get it to stop and they had to reboot the console. It took about four or five minutes and oh. then it was totally fine. Mid-show? Mid-show, oh. yeah, like third song in. And stuff like that scares me to death yeah. and I'm, I don't like being scared. So I like the reliability of my DLive a lot. It's, it's really treated me really well and I can't see myself using anything else in the near future, for okay. sure. Uh, how many inputs are you running? Uh, with Story of the Year, we're using 28 inputs, okay. uh, including talkbacks. Okay, how many uh, drums? Uh, let me think about, well, let me count. Uh, 12 drum channels. Okay. <laughs> I'm cheating, I'm looking at my no, no, uh, layout great. here. You're great. So yeah, 12 drum channels, two bass channels. Um, I get a clean bass channel right off of the bass. And then uh, Adam, our bass player, has a Sans amp with a uh, compressor pedal. Uh, so then he gives me a process channel. Our guitar player, Ryan, uses a Line 6 Helix. I just get a stereo pair from him. I've got four vocalists. Everybody in the band will sing at some point or another. Cool. Dan, our singer, is one of the strongest vocalists I've ever worked with. Uh, I do minimal stuff to him on the board, and, and everybody asks if we use auto-tune or other effects, and we don't. Okay. It's just, it's all Dan. Do you uh, have any outboard stuff you're using? Do you using waves? For the first using? time ever on a tour, I'm using okay. waves this I tour. I thought I saw a yep. little W. I've got a little compact yeah. uh, 1C under there. Okay. And I use one single plug-in, F6. <laughs> Just for one plug-in? Yeah. Wow. I, run, I run F6 on my left, right. Okay. Uh, I like it. It just allows me to massage the sound just a little bit more than what I get from the PEQ and the Dyn8. Um, but the thing I really like about the, the F6 is I can solo the EQ frequency that I'm trying to adjust and I can hear it. If DLive did it, if anybody from DLive is listening, uh, <laughs> that would be an awesome feature to include is to be able to like listen to the actual band that you're addressing. Um, but that's the only reason I use it. And uh, <laughs> it's crashed on me already on this tour. So yeah. I, just, I just don't, uh, I've been pretty vocal about how much I really don't care for waves in general. Yeah, uh, I've been noticing a trend with that. A lot of people <laughs> are just, they're stepping away from it a bit. It's such a cool product. Like they have everything you could ever possibly want and it works great in studio environments, but live it, it will burn you at some point. And our second show of, the, of this tour leg, uh, I lost my left right, because I, I run the F6 on left right. And I just, I knew, I instantly knew it was waves. I just bypassed the insert and I lost audio for about three seconds. Really embarrassing for me, but nobody really noticed, you know, and, and it's been fine. Again, I'm knocking on wood. It's been fine ever since, but just in the back of my mind, I just don't trust it 100%. I know guys run massive, massive shows on it with redundant servers, but I'm a little guy out here with one plug-in running on a server and I just, I can't bring myself to buy a redundant server, you know, with the hope that sure. if it crashes, it takes over. So, sure. I don't know, we'll, uh, we'll get through it, but it's, uh, I like the F6 a lot. Um, I like a lot of stuff that Waves does. I just don't use it live. Okay. I'm pretty minimalist. Uh, Dyn8, are you using that? I use Dyn8 on every single channel. Every channel. Yeah, I put okay. it on every single channel. Um, my reasoning for it is probably not very sound, but I know that uh, Dyn8, I think, introduces a few samples of latency, like four samples or okay. something like that. Uh, so I put it on every single channel so everything stays aligned and in time with one another. But then it also just gives me the opportunity to side chain something off of something else if I need to. And uh, if something is annoying me or if it's really critical that something is comes through. Face is going Sorry. Yeah, you're good, let's do it. <laughs> the joy of doing this in a yeah. live. Yeah, go for it, Bon. I love the soft keys. I, I do so much stuff with soft keys too. What are you using for your soft keys right now? So, uh, the, the first three are uh, mix matrices. So I, what I do with my left-right channel 
is it goes, my left right feeds all of my matrices. So my left right stereo mix, my subs, my fills, and I have some other matrices that aren't on this layer. But if I need to make a change to my front fill, I just want to add vocals to my front fill. If I hit that soft key, it's automatically selected and is mixing the front fills. And then I can go to my vocal channel and add a little bit more of Dan's vocals to the front fills. Because uh, people that ride the rails, um, they always, I, I talk to a lot of them and they think they're going to get the best sound up front. And it's really fun to be really close to the band and everything. But what I don't think a lot of them realize is it's not really the best for sound. You yeah. get all the stage bleed. You're usually out of line of the main PA hang, yep. so you're relying on those front fills. And in most instances, if the stage isn't really high enough, that, that front fill is only hitting literally the front row. So I always boost my vocals in the front fills over top of my left-right mix just to sort of reinforce it and make sure that everybody up front can hear Dan or, who, or whoever I'm mixing up there. So yeah, that's uh, my matrices are the first three. And then I've got a series of mute groups over here so I can mute my drums, my instruments. Uh, my tracks, my vocals, a mute all, so that's like the emergency kill everything. I've got my snare bomb, you know, so every once in a while I can uh, hit a, a snare bomb. Ooh, can you explain uh, the snare bomb? Yeah, sure. So what that is, is uh, it's a really um, exaggerated reverb effect. So okay. when our drummer hits like a certain note, maybe at the end of a song or at the end of right before a breakdown or something like that, uh, the snare will sound like it's literally exploding. It'll, the reverb will just decay for five or six seconds. How do you have that set up th on here? Sure. So this is this is tied to the send on my um, on my uh, verb for the snare. So uh, another thing I use are DCA spills. So these two buttons are DCA spills. So I populated this DCA group with all of my effects sends. So when I hit that button, no matter where I'm at on the console, when I hit that FX send. Um, I am instantly transitioned over to all of my effects units, uh, the send side of them. So my snare bomb it happens to be this channel right here. So it's a reverb unit with five seconds of, of uh, decay. And then um, I sort of tailored the, the sound of it to work just with our snare. So when I hit the snare bomb button, watch what happens to my mute, it opens up. So that allows the sound of the snare to enter that effects unit and then it uh, plays through the PA. And as soon as it's done playing, I hit mute so it doesn't capture any other noise at all. So I know when Josh, our drummer, is gonna hit that one note that I want, I'll just hit that button real quick. The snare noise will come through. It will hit that effect unit. It'll be a really long, massive, explosive reverb sound. And um, I'm being summoned again. And You're then good. everybody hears a cool, cool sound effect, so. Hey, oh, something's patched wrong over here. Can you move me over here, please? Sure, copy that. So we use a, uh, the other inputs that we have are talkback groups, which you just heard me talking to one of our stage techs, Bon. Bon's a great guy, really good stage tech. Um, and then we have a talkback for our drummer, Josh, because he controls the start of all of our songs. And if he needs something, he can talk to us in our ears. And then there's a talkback for the band on the next to the drum kit. So um, if one of the guys has a problem and they need uh, to change a pack or something like that, they can run over, hit a button, talk to us, and we can get it resolved. And then a couple of crowd mics and, and that's it. So I use the crowd mics just for recording purposes. I record every single show of ours in multi-track. Um, so I archive them. And then if the band ever decides they want to do a live release of something, they have completely pristine 96 kilohertz uh, captured tracks wow. from the D-Live and from every single show. So, wow. and then I use it for rehearsals and practice and things like that too, so. Cool. Yeah. Do you have to run up there? I do. Okay. Yeah. Can we uh, maybe show some drums yeah. after that? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Cool. Yep. Go. So this is our wonderful God rack here. Um, this, ah, sorry. You know. when the guys decided to start touring again, um, they sort of rebuilt their rig from scratch. So all of this is relatively new to them. So for their ears, they're using an X32 rack with a Midas DL32 stage box. So that gives them 32 inputs and 16 outputs. Um, we have five sets of in-ears, so we're using 10 of the outputs for in-ears. Josh, our drummer, also has a butt kicker built into the drum throne. So every time he hits the kick drum, he feels a pulse in his uh, throne. And so we use one of the outputs from there for that. We have an analog split, which is why this is a little messy. This whole rig is designed to fly because the guys do a lot of like fly date festivals. Like we'll be going to the Philippines at the end of March and then we're going a couple of other places I can't talk about quite yet. Yeah. Um, but last year we were in Indonesia, Australia, uh, Thailand, a um, number of places. 
So all of these are drop-in racks. This is my mix rack here, drops into a SKB case. Um, then I've got a Shure ULXD unit for our, some of our wireless uh, stuff. But it's great because it's modular and it can fly nice. The bad thing is for these like domestic tours, it's a little bit messy and there is patching every day, but they don't tour frequently enough for us to invest in a big rack where everything has splits that are permanently wired. So it just means a little extra setup and tear down each day, but it works really well for us. And then they've got their ears over here, all the Sennheiser units. Uh, and then Adam, our bass player, that's his uh, bass rig down there with a ULXD. We're pretty much using ULXD wireless on everything, uh, vocals and instruments, and then the Sennheiser ears uh, for, their, for their IEMs. Tell me a little bit uh, about why you went with the ULXD. I love it. I've been on it for a really long time. Uh, and for me, the, the value for what I need, it, it presents the greatest uh, return on investment. So the ULXD is significantly less expensive than Axiant, uh, and it was more readily available when I was buying things. Yeah. So I love having the four channels of ULXD. It gives me the opportunity to have some spares. I carry um, extra mic sticks all the time, extra instrument packs all of the time. And um, it's just it just suited what I needed it for. It has all the networking capabilities. It doesn't have some of the bells and whistles that Axiant have, and don't get me wrong, I'd love Axiant, but uh, uh, for what it costs, it, it yeah. really works really well. Great bang for the buck. Yeah, yep. And then the guys all have Axiant for their instruments, or I'm sorry, ULXD for their instruments as well. So Ryan is on uh, ULXD G50 in Guitar Land, and Ryan, uh, Adam's on G50 ULXD in, in Bass World. So Cool. Yep. And I just love, uh, I could go on about how much I love the, uh, the way that Wireless Workbench works so yeah. well with it. And I never have any problems finding frequencies for any of my Shure equipment. The Sennheiser stuff is a little more tricky. It doesn't quite have the resolution that the Shure has, yeah. uh, which in certain markets like Atlanta uh, can be a little tricky. Absolutely. Are you using the Wireless Workbench? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. I use it every day. I plug it into the uh, ULXD quad. I do a scan. I have my inventory in there. It assigns everything, and it's it's a no-brainer. Um, every once in a while, I'll get lazy and just use the Sure Wireless Frequency Finder website. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll go to that group and just scan. You know, if it's a quick throw and go, yeah. and it works. It works great. Uh, Do you again, also post to the website too? Uh, I don't. I, no? I'm a I'm a taker, not a giver. So I should probably try to give back to that community. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I really I Sure is probably my most favorite microphone company uh, out there. Okay. Um, yeah, you want to go look at drums? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, what capsules are you using for the? Uh... Uh, Beta 58s and uh, SM 58s are okay. what we use for vocals. Um, I've tried a number of other capsules, and I know I have a lot that I really don't like. <laughs> but the SM 58 and the Beta 58 seems to work well. I mean, it's been around for what 70 years. Oh. So it, I mean, they at know the end of doing. the zombie apocalypse is going to be what? Yeah. Cockroaches and 58s. <laughs> They'll be singing into them. Yeah. This is a beautiful drum set, yeah, by he, the way. I love, 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 love the color on this. Can you walk us through a little bit about your mics on this? Sure, yep. So yeah, this is Josh's DW Collector Series uh, kit, custom kit. Um, pretty much toms and snare top are Sennheiser 904s. I was using Shure Beta 98s, but he uh, hits really, really hard and the Beta 98s were just picking up too much bleed, mm. and I was trying to gate it out, and I was losing a lot of di dynamics, and we just don't have enough inputs to use triggers to control it more. Sure. I would love to, because I'd love to go back to 98s, but I wanted to clean up the sound a little bit, and the easiest way to do it was with 904s. They sound- Help they the weeder! Help <laughs> the weeder! <laughs> I told you never to come up here. <laughs> that was Ryan. Uh, those guys are so fun. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we're using 904 capsules. They sound great, they work well, they're inexpensive, uh, they're easy to deploy. I use a Beta 98 on the bottom of the snare just to capture that uh, dynamic and the, the openness of that. Uh, kick drum, I use a Bayer Dynamic TG71 on the inside okay. and a Audix D6 on the outside. Okay. I really like the TG71. Most of my kick uh, sound comes from the 71. I use the D6 just very sparingly for a little bit of air. Uh, on the hi-hat, I have a SE7. Not my most favorite mic, but it's okay. super compact, very cheap. Um, if something happens to it, I don't really worry about it too much. All the mics are mine also, I should sh I should share. Wow. Yep. 
Um, and then for the ride, I'm using a Beta 98. Uh, it just picks up that, all of the nuance that he does in a lot of songs come through super clear. Overheads are Sennheiser Mark IV, uh, large format condensers. And I like those, I don't run any, uh, it's a lie. I think I do put a little EQ on them now, but shout out to my friend, Nick Rucker from Steel Panther. He turned me on to those on one of my first tours ever. And I love them. They're just a little bit unwieldy. Uh, they're large. Um, and the mounts for them are plastic, which like to strip very easily. So that's okay. a little bit annoying. Okay. <laughs> but I just love how they sound. So I'll put up with that. Uh, one of our favorite things are these Stage Ninja clamps. Uh, they, they work so much better than LP claws. They're sort of like a gro GoPro uh, clamp, if you will, but they're designed to work with microphones and they're just really flexible and easy to use. And then I use a Beta 98 on the side snare. Uh, he uses that on a couple of songs uh, to emulate uh, some tones from the album. So this it's, is a really cool side snare, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it's a little 10 inch, it's 20 plies. Uh, so it's a pretty heavy duty little guy. Yeah, Yeah. 20 ply? Yeah. Jeez. But it cuts through like crazy. And they're all from St. Louis, so he's a Cardinals fan, so it's done up in the Cardinals decor there. Um, that's, a, that's the talkback switch. So he has a microphone up here, uh, so he can sing backups or harmonies if he wants to, but if he needs to talk to the crew or the band, he can hit that little foot switch and just talk to us through our in-ears, and the audience will never hear it. So it has two positions. Uh, green is for crowd, and then if he hits the button, it goes red for talking back to the ears. So has he ever accidentally? Uh, no, he's pretty good about it. So Sung to you guys or yelled <laughs> to the crowd? No, no, <laughs> uh, no. So it, he's, he's pretty sharp and, and on it. The band has something similar here for their talk back system. So if somebody has a problem or wants to crack a joke, there's a lot of joking that goes on in our in-ears. A uh, guy will come up and he'll hold this down. And then as soon as he lets off, it mutes it again. So. Um, he can, they can talk into the mic and tell us something funny or ask for something and, and only we hear it, so. So real fast guys, PTT, push to talk. Yep. For people who don't know, if the band wants to only the band to hear or him to hear it, they're gonna walk back here, hit this, talk to this, the band doesn't, or the crowd doesn't hear, right. only you hear or band hears yeah. Yeah. with that. Exactly. So just explaining that a little bit, but that's actually pretty common in this industry is to have. Yeah these around. And like with Atreyu, we have five of those, uh, two on stage and three for crew. So there's a lot more talk back systems, yeah. but these guys are pretty easy going and, and pretty simple guys. Uh, so the one, they just run up, but it's mostly to tell us jokes. They're not really <laughs> doing anything too critical. So you guys should do like a live stream of just the- Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. We, <laughs> that could be interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, you said with drums and with bass, they were direct. There's no amps on stage, correct? No, we're ampless, um, which uh, is a little bit disappointing. <laughs> <Amplis. laughs> yeah. It's a little bit uh, disappointing to those guys. It took a little bit to get them to trust in not having amplifiers. The first tour, that I did with them in 2022 when they were sort of coming back. Um, they carried cabinets just in case the helix went down or just in case the bass pedal went down, but we never used them. And uh, Ryan, the guitar player who ran up here a minute ago, he's infamous for doing backflips off of his uh, guitar amp. He's said he's gonna do it on this tour. He's feeling good again. He injured his leg. Uh, he's a crazy person. He does like He'll run around in the winter with no shirt, no shoes, no socks, and do ice baths. And like, Jeez. he does all the, the, but he's the healthiest of all of us. So, you know, more power to him. So let me ask you this then. If, um, how do you keep that feel for them? Because I know that's a lot of complaints that bands have is like having that energy and having that feel up here. Yeah. With the amps gone, they don't have that. How did you? It's all in their ears and their tones. Um, they, Ryan is uh, a musical master. He's got his tones so dialed in and he, he dialed them in, uh, in on his ears and didn't really necessarily match the album note for note or tone for tone, but he knew what would work live and it works really well out That's front. Cool. So um, it sounds great, uh, but a lot of musicians, I think, try to match exactly what they did in the studio. And that's awesome, but studio stuff is massaged, you know, to yeah, fit very cool. specifically in a studio mix. And in live situations, that doesn't always translate as well. And you guys using tracks at all? Uh, we use minimal tracks. We have intro tracks uh, between songs. We have some sub drops, you know, like you'll, you'll feel your pants move tonight yeah. from those. Um, some ahs and oohs backgrounds uh, and some keyboards. Um, but really, they're minimalist. I think I get five tracks from them total. I think people, it, it's tough because 
I don't think people understand how much they use tracks, but it's tough to emulate what was done in the studio with all that stuff. And you know, the fans listen to those albums yeah. and they get used to that and hearing that. Yeah. So how do you? And they want to come to the show to hear that exact song. Yeah. So it's hard to do that with just the people here. And, and you, it's not necessarily cheating using it. It's just trying. Yeah. You can't have an entire orchestra or right. all crazy background singers or yeah. keyboard players with it yeah. for that one little. Yeah, spoiler, uh, almost every single band in the world uses tracks to yes. some extent. So, yes. um, But like you said, people expect to hear the album yeah. and you can't really justify bringing a string quartet for half of a song Correct. on tour. You know, it just wouldn't work out. So yeah, yeah you track it. It's not cheating, guys. No. Yeah. <laughs> every, yeah, it's just a supplement. And I mean, are there bands out there that use a lot of tracks? Yeah, uh, these guys don't, you know, and most of the bands I work with, all the bands I work with, uh, use very minimal tracks. So I love it. I, it's, I like the purity of it. And the, these guys are still pretty punk rock, even though they're in their 40s now, you know, they, they, they like the rawness of it. So what they call it, uh, elder emo? Elder emo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. technically I'm an elder emo now. <laughs> uh, can we talk vocals? I yeah, see a absolutely. Couple things going on here. Yep. Um, Man, so many people have been using this. Octogate, Octogate, baby. Yeah, it's a lifesaver. Yeah. Especially on smaller stages. Like, we did an amphitheater tour this summer, and we did not need them because uh, we, we had great distance between the mics and the drums. Um, but in smaller clubs and theaters, uh, Octogate's a real lifesaver. Uh, I actually have one in my pocket. Um, so, yeah, the Optigate is, uh, it, it goes between the microphone and your XLR cable, and it's essentially a gate so when you're not standing directly in front of it the microphone is effectively shut off there's a little um le uh, i'm sorry infrared sensor here and it you can set the distance to which it detects a person or an object in front of it and until a person or object breaks that infrared beam this will not open up and turn on so you can adjust the sensitivity of it so the person can be this far away from it or has to be this close to it but it silences the mic when somebody's not on it singing, and that eliminates a lot of cymbal wash. Um, it would eliminate amplifier bleed, but we don't have amplifiers on stage. Yeah. So it's really just mostly to keep the drums out of the vocal mics when there's not somebody singing on the mic. And I love them. I have uh, a half a dozen of them, um, that, but I only need two on this tour, yeah. so yeah. Do you guys put crowd mics in the ears? We do, yep. So one thing I, uh, I want to mention about that he has here is the crowd mics and to get rid of that boxed in feeling on your ears, a lot of bands complain about like, I don't want to do ears because I can't hear anything with that. So you add crowd mics. Why do you add that? Uh, mostly so that the guys get a feel of the room and like you said, to open up their ears a little bit. Now we did just switch to 64 audio ears. So they have the ambient filters in them also. Oh, okay, cool. So they do allow some bleed from outside, but they do run a fair amount of crowd mics in their ears. Um, they're stereo, so the left side of the room, they hear it in their left ear, the right side of the room, they hear it in their right ear. Um, it also helps when like people are yelling something up from stage, like, hey, it's my birthday. Yeah. You know, you don't just see a mouth moving and have no idea what they're saying. It, the mic will usually pick it up in between songs. Sure. Um, we, we do some polarity stuff with it, and we do a lot of high passing just to sort of clean up the, the ear mix for them but essentially it's just a lot to allow them to hear the room and what's going on and not feel like they're stuck in a, in a closet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are they running their own pedals over here? Yeah, See this is Ryan's here? rig over here. Yep. I know nothing about this rig. I might need Bond to, to run us through it a little bit more. <laughs> so yeah, this is the Line 6 Helix. Oh, that mic is hot. Uh, this is Line 6 Helix. Uh, it's got a... Uh, expression pedal on the side so you can change pitch or dynamics um, and then he has the whole set programmed into here so the first song well it's page avenue tour but um, so he's got every song programmed into there and at certain points in the song he will jump to a clean channel or an overdrive or whatever and he can tune his guitar on there as well uh, i really like the line six helix a lot I, I was a kemper guy and then i started listening to helixes and i really like the helix a lot um, other bands I work with use neural DSPs, which are great. Yep. Yep. And then there's Axe FX out there, which are also great too. But I don't know, the Helix, for me, I, I'm really digging it these days right now. And Ryan, like I said, is a musical master. So he's got this thing 
dialed uh, so perfectly. Um, it's just great. He travels with a spare. Ryan's a, uh, a guy that believes in belts and suspenders. So he's always prepared. So he has another Helix just in case something happens. And we really did have to talk him out of taking another amp and, and uh, cabinet just in case. So, but I think he's trusting in the system now and uh, knock on wood. It's what, third or fourth time <laughs> I run out of wood to knock on. Uh, but yeah, it's, everything's been great. So no complaints. Awesome. Yeah. The other cool thing that we use are these little cat boxes. Uh, it sounds weird to say a cat box, but we use these stage boxes uh, from Rat Sound. Oh, yeah. Yep. So it converts four XLR signals to a single uh, Ethernet cable. And so we have two of these downstage and it just cleans up the stage. We don't have like a big multi-core um, copper cable running back to our stage rack. We just yeah. have two little ethernet cables. So when we finish here, we'll coil these up, throw them in the corner, they're out of the way and we can deploy them in like two seconds. And we were, we had been using another brand but we switched over to the Rat Sound ones um, for this tour and really phenomenal. I really like them a lot. Awesome. Yeah. And then uh, you said the bass is direct. Does he have a pedal board as well? Yeah, he's or? got one over here. Yeah, let's go back over towards the rack. What do you think that T stands for? It's like Super T. It's the Superman. Uh, this is weird. <laughs> huh. I just noticed it, so. I think it's a... Uh, uh, I was easily distracted. Pull the lever, Kronk. Right. <laughs> yeah, so this is Adam's pedal is it board. Is over here? Yeah, yep. He'll come over here. Oop, you okay? <laughs> he'll... Uh, yeah, he'll come over here, he has a tuner, so when he needs to tune his bass or mute it for any reason, he hits the tuner pedal. And then he's got his uh, compression pedal there, the Cali 76. He's been using that for years. That thing probably has stories uh, that nobody should probably ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's his compression pedal. And then um, we take the DI signal right here. Um, it's just a really simple DI parallel in out uh, for instrument side and then one XLR out. Uh, the company that makes these um, escapes me at the moment, but they're phenomenal because they're a magnesium case, so they're 100% shielded. They'll never pick up Talk noise. Talk about the boss? Uh, no, this, this uh, DI box. In oh, the, the DI box. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's like LBK, LBP uh, Industries, I think it is. Huh. Um, they're really well designed, really clean, really natural, neutral sounding. They don't add any color. Indestructible. Um, and so simple, and I I love those. Um, I I wish I knew more about them, but I just I stumbled on them, and I've never used anything else. So, I take the clean bass signal off of that. That's what this lone XLR is doing, and then from the compressor it goes over to his rack, and then we get a process signal from that. So, cool. yeah, cool. Doing uh, some lighting stuff. It looks like. Well, man, thank you so much for walking us through all this. I'd yeah. like to actually, when we have a, uh, we might take a break here and then maybe pick your brain a little bit about some more stuff. Maybe sure. Because you're not just front of house for this, correct? Right. I tour manage front of house. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to talk to you a little bit about yeah. that tour management aspect yeah. of that as Let's well. Yeah. Let's do it. But, man. Oh, oh well, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your sound guy hated our mics. I know. Rubbing I know. On each <laughs> I want you to see how cold it is here. We're actually literally, <laughs> I'm going to do the interview like this just so we can I think it just turned off oh dang it <laughs> all right we are hanging out in the green room um because Atlanta. it is freezing here uh, i want to ask you a question about the uh, so you're wearing multiple hats here you're doing yep. the tm pm tm tm right tm front of house yep okay uh explain to the people that may not know what does it mean to be a tm Tour manager is essentially the person that's responsible for the tour. Uh, so it, your job starts well before the tour actually hits the road. Uh, I work with our booking agents and our managers to learn about all of the venues that we'll be playing at and the schedule of events. And then I work with a bus company to find somebody to drive us around, uh, work out a budget with them. Then I route how far we can drive each day um, and if we have a day off or we have to stop um, bus drivers can only drive so many hours in sure. a day and so i'll find places where we can stop where the bus can be parked because you can't just park a 65 foot long bus and trailer you know anywhere uh, so it, it involves calling a lot of hotels. look at you new york <laughs> yeah yeah tm is sort of all encompassing so sure. tm is responsible for pms stage managers PM is production managers. You, in a big tour, you would have a production manager, 
a stage manager, a lighting director, an electrician, carpenters, blah, 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 so blah, blah. So does the buck stop with you? Not usually. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pass the buck. No. Deflect. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, it, ultimately, yeah. Uh, I'm responsible for making sure that we get to where we have to be. Uh, that process starts before the tour even hits the road. So I work with management and booking agents, and I put together a routing for our buses and or trucks, um, negotiate with busing companies to get buses assigned to the tour that work with your budget, and then um, planning out all the stops along the tour. Um, so luckily with story of the year, the guys are pretty low maintenance. I don't Love have to. You. <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> uh, so what's, what's hard to work with, the band or with the label? Is it, would you say it's harder with the band? Would I say it's harder with the band? Is it harder to work with the band? <laughs> no, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> no, the band is great. Uh, I'm so lucky to work with these guys. Yeah. They're, they're very low maintenance. Um, they take care of themselves for the most part. Some tour managers have to you know, do everything from get coffee for the, the, the band members you know, first thing in the morning and make sure that, you know, uh, fresh fruit is laid out or whatever, these guys will take care of themselves, so it makes my life pretty easy. Is there any weird requests that the band has? Uh, I do have one vegan on the tour. Actually, I have two vegans on the tour. We're not weird anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> slightly. Uh, no, nothing. They're, they're pretty straightforward. So, um, But yeah, to answer the question a little more seriously, TM, um, I'm responsible for the tour. So I make sure that we get to where we have to be on time. I build the schedule for each day. I advance with the venues to make sure that they know what to expect when we arrive and that they have what we're expecting from them when we arrive. Um, make sure that we have enough labor hands available to help us load in and load out, uh, change over the stage, make sure that the, the PA, if we're not carrying PA is adequate, that we've got enough power for our lighting systems. A lot of logistical things and all that happens before the tour even starts. You'll spend a couple of weeks preparing for the tour before you even see your first road case. And then during the tour, um, you're responsible for all of the accounting. So all of the settlements that we do each night uh, where the band gets paid for their performance. Um, we settle all of our merch sales. And then I report all of that back to our business manager and accountants uh, daily. So I create reports track all the cash that you carry, make sure you get deposits in the bank so you're not carrying too much cash. Um, it's a lot of uh, paperwork, a lot of logistical stuff, a lot of managing people. You have to try to get along with everybody, which is easy. Our crew is really great. The, the tour is really easy to work with. Um, the band is, aside from Adam, very easy to work with. Um, can I even mention your name or look you in the eye? Okay, sorry. <laughs> they're, they're goofballs, so um, it's really easy. And then I work with our bus driver to make sure he has a hotel each day because when he arrives to the venue, he'll go to the hotel and sleep during the day and I've got to make sure that he can get checked in early. Um, a lot of people use a travel agent. I like to do it myself. I have a little oh, more wow. control over it. Yeah. And um, I'm also a little more cost conscious. I learned that from Justin, who you talked to, the, our drum tech. Uh, he TMs other bands as well. And uh, he's very budget conscious and I picked that up from him. So I always try to save the band as much money as I can. And if it means our driver has a hotel that's two miles from the venue versus 0.8 miles from the venue, but it's a hundred bucks less per night, I, yeah. I just try to watch the money pretty yeah. closely, so. That's a lot of stuff to handle, especially yeah. with while wow, running sound. How do you, uh, and I, I think it, it speaks to a lot of the trust you have in the people as well, because I mean, uh, to be able to, you, do you have to kind of turn off the switch to TM when you're running sound? So yeah. Do you want a good sounding show or do you want me to handle your issue at the moment? How do you balance that? Uh, it's tricky. Um, a lot of times during show, something will be happening at the venue and the general manager or the venue's production manager will be texting me or calling me on a radio while I'm running the show. And you just have to, you have to be very good at multitasking and um, you know, know where to put your attention in certain places. So um, I do all of our effects on vocals uh, in real time, nothing's programmed. So if I'm in the middle of a text conversation but I know I have to accentuate something Dan is singing, I'll stop, throw that delay, bring it back down, go back to my text. And so you're in a lot of places all at once mentally yeah. uh, and sometimes physically. So yeah. it can get to be a little challenging, but it's just prioritizing. 
So how'd you get into the TM position? Did you do front of house and then slide over to the TM as well? Or did you do like? Yeah, uh, so I started- Did you come in as both? <laughs> no, I started touring really late in life. Okay. I wanted to tour my whole life, um, but I ended up spending the majority of my professional career as a project manager. And so I worked for a Fortune X whatever company as a project manager and managed teams of up to like 700 people. Okay. And I was really good at planning and scheduling and budgeting. And so this is like easy that. for you. Oh yeah, this is pretty great. Other than one person, <laughs> you're just gonna be the recurring joke on this. <laughs> he started it, right? It should be a bit. I'm a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. No, so uh, I had all those abilities and, and familiarities. And so the, the tour managing part just came sort of naturally to me. Uh, the first tour I did, I only did sound. And then I started to do some stage management and production management. And then I offered to tour manage for them also. And it just went from there. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic hit right when I was getting into the swing of things. And uh, so I had a couple of years off of not doing anything. And then when the pandemic sort of lifted, I got offered a number of tours on one day and all of them were TM front of house positions. And I really honestly don't know how that happened. <laughs> it, yeah. it was a surprise to me, but I took a tour and then that led to another tour and another tour and here we are. So for the people that are watching this that want to be in your shoes, or what, what advice would you give them or are you starting off like, hey, I would love to be an engineer, maybe even at one point a yeah. touring or a tour manager. I think knowing what I know now, I would work at a local venue that gets a lot of touring acts coming through. That's smart. Yep, and I, you're gonna push cases, you're gonna sweep floors, you're gonna coil cables. It's not gonna be, you're not gonna jump out and mix Metallica you know, on your first night. Yeah. Um, but you just put the time in and the effort and be a good person. Uh, I know a lot of engineers near where I live that are amazing engineers, like can mix the socks off of anything. They don't get tours because they don't have tour experience because one of the biggest things people are worried about is what's it like to live with this person on tour? Because we have 10 people living in a metal tube that goes down the road and we're gonna drive 16,000 miles on this tour in you know four weeks. Um, you're spending a lot of time with a lot of people in very close quarters. And there's a saying like, is the person a good hang? Yeah. Uh, you have to be a good hang. Uh, if you're mediocre at your job, but you're a great hang, you're gonna get more work than the guy who is amazing at his job, but miserable to be around. What did, uh, I did an interview with Phil where he, he said something of, I'm paid to be here for an hour and a half, but I'm hired for the 22 and a half hours. Yeah, it's a good. Like, that's a good point. Yeah, but yep. I've also heard that you're paying, uh, the sound is free, you're paying me to be away from my family. <laughs> Like, uh, oh, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah, uh, I could see that. I don't have family, you know, so that part's easier for yeah. me. And it's why I was able to, at a late stage in life, be able to jump in and go live on a motorhome, you know, and make 75 bucks a week, you yeah. know, because I didn't have family and uh, kids or anything like that. I was able to just pack up and go quit my job and jumped in a motorhome and that was it. So uh, I'm very lucky in that respect, but it's definitely, I know like the band in particular, they really miss their families. Yeah. And uh, so we only tour three to four weeks at a time and then they go home and spend time with them. And you know, it's a good balance. Cool. Yeah. Well, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Yep. Um, look forward to hearing some of the show. Yeah, hope it's good. We can do the. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to a fist bump. I have a friend who does this. Oh, <laughs> I like it. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Steve's the best. <laughs> We are here with Justin. Justin is a drum tech for Story of the Year, and also uh, Atreyu. Any more? Uh, I've worked for other bands. I worked for Pop Evil, Rake Benjamin. Uh, I think um, Crown the Empire. Okay. And okay. I was on tour with with, uh, with these Pop guys? No, with Pop Evil. They were a buy on with one of the ones that we were on. Oh, really? Yeah, way oh, back in the day. They were great. They're yeah, an awesome, awesome group. Awesome group. The crew was probably one of my ultimate crews I've ever worked for. Who's your favorite band to tour with and your least favorite? And give us the intimate stories of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, can... yeah, right? They're all amazing. <laughs> my least favorite, not a damn one of them. I like to keep my job. Exactly. <laughs> the intimate stories, they're all just stellar human beings. No one farts, no one burps, no exactly. one does it. All know. amazing drummers. All amazing all drummers. fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Guitars are always perfect. Everything's in 
incredible. I, exactly. There's no. Every day is a happy day. Yeah, there's no problems on the there's road. There's nothing. No. Not one. Yeah. yeah. So my channel is typically is audio guys, but we've been we've been going more into the other sides of touring, and touring is really, you know, there's a lot of different facets, and I think people have been fascinated by the uh, the other sides of it, and what I've noticed that people just think the drums show up and the drummer sets it up. Uh, and they do in the, in the beginning, obviously, yeah, for it, but so. once you grow, you get to actually a drum tech. Yeah. Um, and typically the drum techs are drummers. Are you a drummer or yep. are you, a, you one yep. of those two? Yeah. <laughs> Failed musician. <laughs> you know, that's what they call. As we all are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you all of a sudden exactly. you know, settle so for less. Do favor. Explain to me what is a drum tech? Uh, a guy who comes in, sets up the kit, uh, polishes, cleans, tunes, uh, make sure the drummer is as solid as possible okay. at his peak performance. So sticks go flying, you yeah. get sticks. Cymbal breaks, you come up, you swap the cymbal out. Yeah. Anything falls, you're, you're his eyes, you're his ears, you're watching, you got in-ears on, you're listening for tones. So for, you're not just setting up and walking away, no, you're actually no. there the whole time. Yeah, you're, the whole set, um, a lot of times you either sit behind the drummer, depending on the, size, the, the stage sizes, you can either sit behind them. I usually sit uh, stage left or behind monitor world. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I got in-ears in, I'm listening to everything, making sure drums are still sounding as good as they were at the beginning. If yeah. not, if I hear any kind of discrepancies, I'll come up, I'll do my tweaks. While he, even if he's performing, I'll still get up there, I'll do a little something. Usually a snare, one of these lugs where most of the guys are hitting constantly will drop. Okay. So it'll, it'll go loose, you just come up, give him a little, Ch -ch -ch snares back into it. Let me ask you this. So for tuning, are you actually tuning to a note for or This is mainly ears. Uh, he likes okay. tubby, okay. Uh, huge toms, Led Zeppelin in a sense. So this is just loose. So how much of it is uh, what you think sounds good and what the artist thinks sound good? Are you just taking what he wants and implementing that exactly. or to the record or? Uh, I, to the record as well. You listen to the record and then listen to what he wants. His feel obviously, the record might sound higher in pitch, sure. and so he might like a a, a tubbier feel okay. for the for the top tom for the top rezo. I'm sorry, batter for these batter heads. Okay, he might want them a little looser, so he runs around. He might want them tighter, so that way, if he's doing like 30 second note fills or something crazy, if he's going around all sure. with a bunch of notes in one place, you want it tight so you get that real quick rebound. What um, is the most common mistake that you see drum techs doing? Or what was one of the hardest things for you to? learn getting into snare. it. Snare. Okay. The snare. It, again, with some drummers, they just want to crack. So you yeah. already know, if I tune that thing to its highest peak almost, figure out a sweet spot. If it sounds good to him, yeah. awesome. Some drummers are more finicky and they want body. They want, sure. you know, they want the natural sound of the fucking shell. They want all these different tones. So then you have to get into like, just, learning this whole snare you know finding out about the snare wires finding out the bed the, the metal the the heads on it that'll make it sound as best as possible so when you get those drummers it gets a little and that's that was something for me when I was working for uh, this uh, Jason from Ted Nugent um, he was a guy who was very meticulous about his snare drum and so it took me a f***ing long time to get it, you know, and it, it drove me absolutely f got it. Once I got it, I was like, yes, yes fine. Yeah. You know, last day <laughs> so, of tour, yay. <laughs> what do you think is the perfect snare drum sound? Do you like the snap one? Do you like a shotgun? Do you want, what? what is your, in your perfect world? I mean, uh, I always th think about like in a room throwing a tennis ball at a fucking wall and okay. there's this weird sound. Mario Duplantier has it. He has this snare sound okay. that I'm just like, oh my God, live on a record anywhere. And for some reason, it, it's like, it reminds me of maybe a, a, a stick on like a tetherball pole. You remember tetherball yeah. back in the day when you hit yeah. that? It, like a stick to a tetherball pole or a, in a tennis ball in a room just chucked out of wall. Combine those two and you have like this. And the best, the, the person that I can, pinpoint is like Mario Duplantier. That snare sound that that gentleman has is incredible. All right, next question. Um, I play drums and I've tuned drums. My hardest thing when tuning drums is getting rid of the ringing sound and toms. What's the trick to it? How do you make the toms Cotton sound balls. good? Cotton balls? Yeah, look in there. 
Turkish cod balls. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen that. So the cotton balls will bounce up and then they'll bounce back down. Usually where you're getting most of your ring is down here in your resonant head. Batter for feel, rezo for tone. So this thing usually will take off. So you can dampen it. This guy takes off a little much. These are uh, color, color tone. They're a little finicky head. Um, so I have a piece of tape on it along with um, the cotton balls and it just it, these things just cut. Boom, boom, boom. They don't go boom. Yeah. yeah. You know, okay. for an hour. They just, they snap and they're short. So front of house loves it, you yeah. know. Same All with right. the kick. It's fully padded. Uh, it's got like a 10 pound um, pillow. There's like this pillow in there that's weighted yeah. up on the front to just make it. Heads are tight because he likes a tight uh, front head. So heads are tight on that. Um, but very damped, so it's short attack. Okay. Yeah. Favorite drum set? Oh, um, there's so many. I'm a D I have DW tattooed on my body. I'm a DW fan. I love it. But like touring, uh, Tama has just okay. the hardware, the way they make their shit, the durability. It looks like you could just throw it off a mountain. All, the whole kit and then just go back down and play it you know like it wouldn't matter it would just set up and probably still be in tune you know uh, it just most works. overrated drum set god damn it, <laughs> it might be you guys <laughs> you know? okay what do you think is the most underrated drum Shit. set oh god pdp okay i think they're making like the most quality cheap kit okay you know perfect size kick drum oh f at this point i'm thinking it's 22 by 14. really yeah this okay. dude on this it has a rogers 22 by 14. okay and it just gave me chills it is so i'm like whoa it just so short so attacky and so short yeah it doesn't have like the depth that this 20 does it you know it has all that room all that air so yeah. it's still gonna have you know this thing just shock it's insane and every day i'm just listening to it like oh my f a 14 would i be interested okay like huh and now i'm thinking about buying a, f a 22 by 14 inch kick just to just to check Simples. it out uh light medium dark what's your what's your uh, flavor I, know, I used to when i was playing um i run i use peisty so i was using like roots and really thick stuff i think it's uh not smart for okay. rooms like this, maybe in arenas and shit. So light, thin, uh, easy. It's all gonna cut, you know? It's like, it's you got microphones, you're in this room. So to have like ride symbols all over this thing, thick rides that you're just hitting is almost like, sure. I don't know, it, it, it doesn't have, it used to have this quality to me where I was like, yeah, I gotta have fucking rude symbols that are massive and a China that just, eats the whole but now you you don't hear the guitars anymore you don't hear the vocals you're not hearing you're barely hearing the drums you know because the fucking cymbals are so loud it's eating the snare which is you know should be the main focal point but uh, well, let me ask you this say somebody's watching this and they're a drummer and they would love to be a drum tech one day and get on tour what advice would you give them to be able to be in your position one day oh man make friends network Network, network, network. That's how I got this whole thing. Yeah. yeah, it was all networking. It was from bands that I toured with. Offered me a gig after I left my band. Um, so just networking, keeping your fucking, keeping that network, that Rolodex constantly going to making the phone call. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to be the guy who calls. I'm always the guy who calls. He gives a fucking call, you know? <laughs> be the fucking guy who calls. If no one's calling you, make sure you call. You know, a lot of people want to sit on their ass and, and make excuses as to why they can't get the job they want or do the life that they want so you just got to be proactive get it there is nothing holding if somebody wants to be a drum tech the only thing you could do get a job at a venue you know meet drummers meet touring drummers F hang out at the back of a damn bus go to the bar you know we all go out at the end of the night go to the local bar the closest bar to a show and find a fucking crew guy and make friends make homies and then just build that relationship next thing you know if you want it you'll you'll get it it's just about networking in here. Everybody. That's how Bond got the gig, just by being a friend. They were like, hey, you're going to be our guitar tech now. He's like, what? Yeah, you're coming. Okay, cool. And I was like, one of the raddest guitar techs in the industry, you know? Like, 
started from just uh, hey come with me so it's just, I think networking if you want to if you want it you'll get it as a drummer as a drum tech as a guitar tech there's so many aspects to this life you be a gaffer you could be a gaffer dude who just runs tape you know they make fucking insane money you could be a playback engineer you could be a drum tech you could be a fucking monitor there's just so many so all right last question if you could be a drum tech for any band right now touring right now who's the dream Gojira Mario Duplantier Gojira yeah that would just that would just make my <laughs> make my so damn life time, appreciate it I appreciate it. you brother yeah no problem yeah. this way yeah we're just we're just working this close oh, yeah this close is this weird I just met you I showered this month this is John Bond Bond John Jonathan Bond Loman there we go he's a uh, guitar tech in, in quotes. <laughs> guitar tech. Guitar pr professional guitar and bass tech. All right, what's a guitar tech? Break it down. Uh, gosh. Uh, well, does it have to do with <clears throat> guitars? It does. And tech work. Okay. It's crazy. Okay. Uh, basically, every day I just kind of I just maintain uh, all of Ryan's guitars and Adam's basses. I'll restring, make sure they're clean. Uh, when you're dealing with cold weather, as we are today, yeah. and we have all up and down the East Coast, uh, you, you kind of just have, it, the weather, temperature, and all that stuff will can change the next like action and kind of bend, and you kind of just got to keep an eye on it. It's not like drastic, but if you don't like keep an eye on it, then it all of a sudden have a bow in it, and I think we don't realize that wood breathes, yeah, and it actually changes based upon temperatures yeah. for it, and you'll go way out of tune yeah. for it. And the same could be said if it's super hot, too. Yeah. Like, you know, it can get gross, and they bend the opposite way. So, so you just come here, tune it, throw it up here, and then walk away and get some coffee, come back and put it away? Is yeah, that... pretty much. Yeah, uh, <laughs> every day, like, uh, especially like when we're coming in for so cold outside, I, I try to get them into room temperature as much as I can okay. before I start really diving into them. And then... Uh, I kind of rotate. Uh, I have it set up to where I don't have to restring six instruments every day. Okay. So like today, I worked on Claude, and uh, tomorrow I'll work on Blue, and then every fourth day I mess with this because he only plays two songs on it, so I really don't have to restring it that much. Plus, it's a Floyd Rose, and I they are my mortal enemy, and I hate them. Why is that? Uh, they're just a pain in the butt to uh, restring. It's not just like a normal one. You kind of oh yeah. And this one's super super rusty. Floating and, bridge. Uh, yeah, the floating bridge. You basically do one string at a time. Otherwise, you have to. I've seen so many horror every... stories of it, like because they took them off, and then yes. the last one is just yes. And then you'll tune this one, and then it'll throw all the rest of them off. Then you tune these, and tune it's miserable. But this one's been through a lot of. So you can see uh, he snapped the headstock off this twice. Uh, I think it was oh. in the, on the first tour he had it. Who's so, the signature? Uh, that is Paul Reed Smith. This was this is one of the custom built ones okay. for Ryan. We have these are all uh, kind of one of ones made just for Ryan. He's been with them since two thousand two or three. Okay. So, they're Paul Reed Smith is fantastic to him. So, they send him beautiful guitars, and same can be said about Ernie Ball. They take care of Adam and send him these goofy old Stingrays. <laughs> How'd you get into, in, uh, into doing this? Uh, so, as I think with a lot of techs I've met over the years, like, I was a band guy for a bit, obviously. Failed look at musicians. Me now. <laughs> failed, failed musicians. Uh, I was in a band, we were like, maybe cool for like 15 seconds, okay. and then uh, we did That's some touring. That's better than me, I was like three seconds. Yeah, hey, man. Yeah, like, that's probably guitar how. Guitar tech. 15 yes. seconds and they turned yes. the song We're talking off. about guitars, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, but yeah, uh, through that, just I toured with some other bands and stuff like that and story of the year I'm from St. Louis and so is story of the year and they were always like local heroes to everybody because they're like oh my god they're proof that we can get signed in St. Louis and it didn't and we didn't so yeah. uh, but I got to become friends with them over the years and uh, legit this is a real story it's kind of infamous in our camp now but I was just hanging out well, like Dan and I hang out all the time and um, I went to the bar with him one night and he's like, dude, are you stoked for Salt Lake City? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, has no one called you? I go, about what? Like, I literally don't know what you're talking about. He goes, oh, we all decided we want you to be our guitar tech now. And uh, we, like, I go, like, when are we going? Like, do, do I get paid? And he was like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, we're gonna pay. I was like, you guys are idiots. I would've went for free. <laughs> so, and like, I go, I don't really know what I'm 
doing. Um, and they're like, you'll figure it out. We just want to hang out. I was like, okay. And I've been with them for eight years and I've been able to make a career out of it and tour with other awesome bands and meet great people along the way. And it's the best job in the world. Awesome. If, All right. You know, if you like travel. Walk me through what you got here. Give me a rig rundown of yeah. what you got, and then what are the the necessary tools for a for for a for a guitar professional tech. Yes. tech. Uh, so right here, we just literally just got. Uh, we have a super simple setup. Uh, Line six Helix, which is our whole uh, you know effects processor. It's all his amp, everything. It literally just runs from downstage into our wireless here, and that's it for okay. Ryan's rig. The rest of this is literally just my junk drawers and my tool uh, stuff. So, you know, in here, just a real, real, uh, Gosh, real organized it. stuff in here. Yeah, someone gave me that sticker. That's not mine. <laughs> uh, some dude in Albuquerque named Titwolf gave me this sticker. So, shout out to <laughs> Titwolf. I wish I, I wish I was making that up. I was like, there's a dude named Titwolf that collects VHS tapes in Albuquerque. It sounds made up. It does. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, uh, this is just like tools, extra strings, guitar picks I keep in here. Down here I keep all my packs and obviously my battery okay. thing broke open. Uh, but yeah, And the all important lab label maker. <clears throat> label maker for all the super important things like naming the instrument uh, slots on the rig, which are not accurate today because I didn't put them in the right spots. Uh, are you using standard <clears throat> tuning for everything? Uh, no, we are in uh, half step down standard for a couple of songs uh so snake is always a uh, half step down like uh standard and then we do drop c sharp for everything else they uh on a couple of the songs on the new record it's actually in drop a but we have a drop setting on the uh flying six who so kind of oh, don't cool. have to have another guitar so cool. it's awesome technology is neat it is neat yes and what then yeah. is what is this is <clears throat> Tell me what that is. Yeah, so here would be uh, an example. Like I worked on uh, old Claude here today, but it's all the workbench here. I'll uh, tune in here, and I can check intonation, uh, clean it all up, and everything like that. And then, you know, just kind of go through our. Why two tuners? Uh, so Peterson is kind of like the tuner of tuners. It's the most accurate tuner out there. Um, sometimes I just use this to kind of get in the ballpark and then I fine tune, fine -tune it to it. make sure that is not a little movement as possible. And also when you tune it, when it's laying down like this, it, it's not really an accurate tuning. You want to always hold it upright kind of thing. So it's weird, but hey, take that. Did I get you? <laughs> no. Sorry, dude. Got try harder. You know, you just so I kind of try to get in this ballpark, and then like right here it's saying it's just going a little bit sharp, but that's okay. But like so, that's like a little bit sharp, and it falls flat. So I would just tune it just to super interesting content. And see, now it's kind of going the opposite yeah. way, kind of thing. So it's just this one's just like the most accurate tuner on the market. It's kind of been that way for forty years. Okay. And then, but this one, it's usually, I literally just keep this one on there because it, in a pinch, if I'm doing it super fast, sure, I'll see the green light go here and then I tune, like, I don't know, it's just one of those things, I kind of look in the middle and when this is green, I just kind of barely touch yeah. it until that stops I like moving. that. <laughs> All right, the most important question that I have now is... Yeah, a slide whistle and toys. A toy. <laughs> so... What, is there a story behind it? Uh, yeah, that's a $46 dinosaur uh, that I won from Dave and Buster's with one of my best buddies, uh, Jason Milbank from uh, Since His Fail. When I was out touring with them, we uh, it's it's dying now. It used to have a whole dance party session. Thing. I get the batteries, hold on. Yeah, right? I know, I've tried, I've looked. Uh, and then also, this is also Jason from Since His Fail's slide whistle. He said he wanted to uh, use this in the middle of a set. He did it once and then I said, hey, I'm just gonna take this on tour with me forever now, so. Uh, every once in a while, when they talk too much, I'll just hit them with this in their ears. <laughs> and I'm just like, hey, hurry the fuck up. Let's go. Land the plane. Yeah, <laughs> land it. Which also, this also helps because that's my direct line oh, to their ears. Okay. So if there's something going on, like, hey, 
something broke downstage, don't start the next song, or okay. anything like that. Or if I just need to remind them to say something, or if I need to tell them to shut up. Or just tell them a fun joke, which we are known to say weird things to each other. So, it's, I've, I've been with them, like I said, f going on my eighth year with them, so they're like my best friends. It's like, I can't believe I get paid to like travel the world with my friends. Yeah. It's kind of dumb, kind of sick. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the best job ever, man. Dude, thank you so much. Uh, I no appreciate worries, you. And if somebody wants to become, someone's watching this, like, hey, I want to be a guitar tech one day, what advice would you give them? Uh, yeah, I, well, I heard Justin kind of mention it. I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, just get out there and meet people. And uh, it obviously helps if you know your way around a guitar. But, yeah. I mean, listen, look at me. I'm eight years in, and when I first started, I was like, uh, I don't really know what I'm doing. So, do you know all. what you're doing now? Or? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> we use a lot of those air quotes. I just watched that Chris Farley skit. Thank you so much, man. No worries, I appreciate man. You. Nice meeting you. Thank you, guys.